All right, peoples, this is Ross. So in today's video, I thought I would update you guys on the greenhouse. There's a lot going on in here. Uh, between the figs, they are now leafing out the potted trees, but you know, also uh, in-ground trees. This is a two-in-one capper fig that I've grafted onto uh, the same rootstock. And actually it has a lot of Brava on it. So we'll talk about even just colonizing the Blastophaga. We're gonna actually mention some of the in-ground cordon figs in here actually are also awake. Uh, we'll talk about the seedlings that you guys see, whether that's the tomatoes here. Many, many varieties of tomatoes this year. It's kind of insane. Um, also the melons that we're gonna look at. Uh, we have microgreens actually back there. And even to my left, we have more tomato seeds I just started. Very sad brassicas. And then also some uh, peas for shoots, kind of like uh, for microgreens in a sense that I'm using uh, for salads. And just also to snack because what's nice about these guys is that they taste just like peas. They're very sweet and you can just break off the tip or even come in here with a knife. I made myself a couple cuts here and have myself a salad. Add a little bit of dressing. These are very tender, very crisp. They're very good. Very sweet. I would argue underrated crop as just like something extra to grow and it doesn't take very long. Very nutritious as well. Um, let's talk about the figs though before we get into the garden. So the figs, have, as I said, they're, they're leafing out and there's a lot less of them in here this year. Usually in this greenhouse, guys, is so many fig trees that uh, you can't walk. And I have them stacked multiple high, but normally they could be even four or five pots high. And the reason that uh, what happens is when, when you do something like that is the higher uh, we are up in the, in the air of the greenhouse, obviously, there's more heat right? Heat rises. So if we have four or five pots stacked, usually the greenhouse floor and the couple levels of pots down below, they stay quite cold and they don't wake up. It takes them a while. I have to move like half of the trees out of here for the other trees to, to actually wake up. I do have the space heater on the floor, which is nice because it, it is sort of blowing air towards this area here. Although um, definitely you can, you can see a big difference between just having simply less trees in here, less pots and how they're able to wake up, how I'm able to manage them. Uh, everything's a lot easier to water. Uh, I actually put down some slow release fertilizer on these trees and they just been going, they've been going like crazy. Some of them are really quite green, really beautiful new growth. Um, and have a lot of new growth to them. A lot of these branches that you might see actually have like four or five leaves at this point, which is awesome, you know? Uh, that's kind of what this whole greenhouse is for, is to really get these guys off and give them a head start. Um, something that we've really been focusing on is obviously the fact that there's less trees in here. Not only have I been able to water them easily, feed them easier, but also there's a lot less density. And therefore, uh, the branching, I've been very, very selective about. Really thinning out all these branches to make sure that they've all given, I've given them enough space to grow and get the right amount of light penetration. Without that light penetration, they don't form fruits. So if we had a lot of branches in here, a lot of green, it would just be too dense and that light that's coming in right now, a lot of the growth is actually, or would be shaded out. In fact, some of it already is kind of shaded out just because there's just a limited amount of light in here. You know, it is what it is. But in order for me to actually form these fruits, and I know these are Braba here, so these will form 
just on last year's growth, but to get the new main crop, you have to have, as the, as the growth is growing, as it's growing, you have to have enough light that's actually hitting that branch. If you don't, as I said, the fruit buds just will not form. So it was really critical for me this year to really focus on first pruning the trees in the fall properly so that we could get good light penetration for the following season. Now that we're in this current season, I've actually been staking branches so that they have more light, especially bending them horizontally or bending them, uh, particularly these scaffolds. If you can think of these two trunks as, a, as two different scaffolds here, definitely bending them more on a, like a 45 degree angle, definitely away from each other giving them that maximum amount of light. And this is another really good example. There's a Smith tree back there and you can see I have made sure that those three branches are now bent away from each other, giving them uh, the right amount of light. And not only did we do that, but we also thinned out this new growth. So this new growth is really key because if you have too much of this new growth and it's growing into each other or it's shading out another branch, your tree is just gonna be less productive. So it's really key for production purposes to get the fruit set that you want to actually be able to do this. And it's really a technique called thinning that really helps that we do every single year, but it's a lot more than that. We've talked in the fall, if you wanna go back and see how we prune these trees, because. For some of you, it's not late. It's not too late to prune your trees. Also the branching and the staking that we've been doing to get these branches away from each other to open up these canopies is also very critical. We haven't done videos on that yet, but we will. And I will show you in separate videos the importance of thinning and, and, uh, and actually staking these branches. But what is nice is that on the ones that are more mature at this point, it's getting difficult to actually get in here, guys. But on these branches here, let's say, that are a bit thicker, have got more growth to them, more leaves to them, um, they're almost getting the right amount of growing degree days. We need that 550 growing degree days. Once we achieve that, here's another really good branch that's got some thickness to it. The leaves are starting to get pretty big. This is a sign we're getting closer to actually forming fruits along these branches. And again, this is really critical to make sure we have that light penetration. We also need the heat because we need 550 growing degree days. Once we achieve that 550, we'll start to see these fruits form and it, it really shouldn't be much longer. I have not pumped up the heat in here. I've actually been keeping it on the cooler side at night but if you were to keep the temperatures in here at night around 60 um, or above 60, you would see fruits form in here very quickly. Uh, I'm not necessarily in any rush just yet. Getting them as early as possible is nice, but if they form now, some of these varieties actually are gonna fruit uh, in June, and I don't mind waiting until July. So, I know the Campanieri in the corner has got some really nice growth to it and uh, it's probably going to form fruits any day now. So that one will probably fruit in June, but uh, usually, typically I see fruits come out of here um, in July, by July 1st. So I'm not really in any rush just yet to, to make anything happen, even to do any pinching. We're just going to let this naturally happen, keep them a bit uh, cooler during the day. I'm gonna keep things in here around 85 during the day. At night, if you can keep it above 60, that's great, but my heater is not actually set to go on at night. And I'd rather have things a bit in here a bit more on the humid side than on the drier side. So that's what we've been doing, is that things are just going really well. It's a slower process this year, but everything's very happy and healthy. And if we were to blast this heat a little bit too soon, we would get the fruits to form at an earlier date, which is nice, but we'd actually sort of stop the growth on those trees. Those, grow, the, the, those trees would stop growing 
and we'd probably just have an overall less production for that year. So there's a trade-off. You want to blast the heater, you'll get earlier fruits. They'll probably taste better at that earlier date as well for most of us. But if you do that, you're going to actually encourage your tree to fruit and therefore have less energy towards growth. And overall, you're going to have lower production for that season. So I'm kind of taking a middle ground here, doing this a little bit slower than we normally do. I've been having learned my lesson over years now, and that's the key. Now, as I've pointed out before, is that actually some of the in-ground cordons around the edges of the greenhouse are actually awake. And you can see right down in there in the middle of the screen is actually a one of the uh, spurs from the cordon back there. That's actually a panache tree in the back. And he goes all the way across that wall. I'm really having trouble here with my camera, excuse me guys. But against this back wall, and we're gonna make sure we go over these cordons as we go, but here's actually a Colonel Lippmann's that is leafing out. It's a little bit further behind the panache, but it is leafing out. We will space in here one fruiting branch every square foot. So we'll have one on the end and then a foot across is another fruiting branch, another foot, another foot, until we have about, I think it's, this is a six by eight greenhouse. So we're not gonna have too many fruiting branches, but they are gonna be productive and they are gonna probably go all the way up by the end of the season to maybe even the ceiling. So that's what you want. You wanna have productive branches, even if they're a bit longer, we gotta give them that right light penetration. And by spacing them a foot is what we wanna do. Here, this capper fig, has really impressed me. Um, I counted, I think, 17 Brava just on the one tree, just on the one variety. And the one variety here is called Bogo Malovo, and we're gonna talk more about this as time goes on, I'm sure, because this variety is extremely hardy, and uh, it has been able to colonize the wasp in very cold places, this capper fig. So I believe, I don't remember exactly, but I think this tree is itself very hardy, but the wasp itself is only hardy to, I think about 12 or 14 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, I think 12 is like 90% kill. So if you have, an, you have a tree you, or you live in an area that stays above 12 degrees Fahrenheit and you get this particular variety, you should potentially be able to colonize the blastophaga anywhere that it stays above 12 degrees Fahrenheit. And that's the minimum temperature for the wasp. And there's actually a Hungarian study that was done um, that I've talked about in the past. Now, what else is very impressive about this variety is that it produces three crops of capper figs pretty reliably. Now you want to have multiple varieties, which is why I have a second here. And actually there is some Brabus forming here, but they're a bit further behind. Not every capra fig is going to produce three crops, you know, regularly. Uh, you may only get one or you may only get two. So to actually colonize the fig wasp, you have to have a consecutive three crops. One, which is the Braba here that you can see, or this is technically the profici if it had wasps in it. And then you would get the second crop, which is technically the main crop, which is gonna form on this new growth. Then you would get a second main crop, which is where the capra figs or the, uh, the blastophig, excuse me, actually overwinters in those figs is a second main crop. And then actually it gets released into this profici sometime in the spring. I would imagine somewhere around now, actually. So it's a pretty impressive variety, I have to say. Uh, I have no doubts, but I'm leaving this property um, very soon in the next 10 months or so. Um, I'm not sure if I'm gonna bother as I had planned to actually colonize the fig wasp because I'm gonna dig this tree up and take it with me um, and put it in a greenhouse somewhere in the future uh, on this new property. So um, 
unfortunate because we have really some consistency, it looks like, starting, which is nice. I could get my friends to send me some Profici, not now, but let's say in May. Um, they could start getting Profici, let's say in California, and then I could give that Profici to this tree when it forms its next set of uh, crop. Even maybe even these, these Bravas here could get pollinated. And that would, of course, hopefully, fingers crossed everything goes right, that would start the process of colonization. So uh, pretty darn cool, I have to say. I think it's very possible, although we are going to have to wait again um, to get this whole thing really going officially. But pretty awesome that this small tree, really small tree, has 17 Braba on it. And I, I don't see any reason why um, this particular capra fig wouldn't be something that's really recommended to a lot of people in the future. Um, a lot of people in Europe, I have a couple friends that really swear by this one. And it's been used over there with great success. So I actually have a few cuttings that I'm propagating that I took off of the tree. And uh, I've tried to share it actually with a few people. Uh, so we'll see if we can spread this variety around in the future uh, more than we already have. Um, pretty impressive, I have to say. Uh, so that's that's roughly it there, guys, for the figs. Um, the seedlings in here really have not been that spectacular. We have transplanted out a lot, so I'm not too worried about the spring garden all that much other than the fennel. The fennel here has to go in and it doesn't look too great. We've talked about on Fruit Talk why that is. These cells, we're just not getting a whole lot of water. But they are starting to grow and putting out their true leaves. I will transplant this out soon, hopefully by the 15th of April. We also have these peas here that I need to transplant out into the garden because my other peas just didn't do well. They're not getting enough water. It's, it's apparent. I wasn't able to get out here. And then the other sad thing is these brassicas. And I thinned these out yesterday, gave them some water today. We transplanted them into these larger inserts. You can see the size of it, like right here. And they're just not doing well. I actually have microgreens of brassicas, of broccoli, right back here and the microgreens are doing better than the individual cells I had and a lot of that is just because they're getting enough water behind it is onions and those onions will be transplanted out into the community garden hopefully around the 15th of April as well um, very heavy feeders those guys now what is I guess going well in here are these peas Given enough soil and water, they're doing well. They work well, I think, as a microgreen crop for salads. The tomatoes, obviously, are pretty darn easy to start. These are some new varieties I started yesterday that we sort of just picked up. Uh, Goose Creek seemed very interesting, and so did Tex Wine. I don't know why the camera just did that. Striped Roman, I'm um, interested. In, in, uh, in trying that one as a paste tomato. Also behind me are tomato uh, seeds we started. Um, I don't know how many days it's been. But these are the, this is the first batch here. So many varieties, we've talked about these varieties. But we added actually about 15 or 20 more since we've talked about some of these varieties. Uh, really excited to see what these guys can do. They're gonna also go out in the garden around April 15th, under low tunnels. So we get to plant them like 15 days earlier than normal. With the low tunnel head start, they are gonna take off. Here we also have the Principe and the Pianolo. These are the two tomatoes that I've decided to plant at the community garden, which I've started multiples of. Um, we're planting them in a row, we're growing them Florida weave style. These are the most versatile tomatoes I have. 
and multi-purpose. I guess you could say that's kind of the same thing, but they're great for drying. They hang well to extend the season and they make a good sauce. So uh, I want to get as many of these, how durable they are, put them over at the community garden where I'm just not going to be all that much and just enjoy, um, you know, having those tomatoes there that are less, you know, more carefree, less problems. And I'll be able to harvest so many tomatoes off of those with, uh, you know, less problems. I don't have to keep an eye on them. So those are the more versatile, obviously. Uh, these tomatoes here will be grown under tunnels vertically. We have the peppers and the eggplants are coming up as well, but a bit slower than the tomatoes. And I think it just hasn't been warm enough in here. Um, I really should probably turn up the uh, temperatures because it, it was a bit dreary and cold the last few days. The really nice thing to see out of all the seedlings is these melons. They just look beautiful. They've all come up so well. Here's some beans I started. We got some soil at um, Municipal Compost, and I wanted to test it because beans seem to struggle with uh, a pesticide that could be in the Municipal Compost. So I figured I'd test it to see what the deal is before I plant my beans. Um, and they seem to be doing all right, so I think we're okay. There's no, uh, there's no pesticide in it that a lot of people seem to be struggling with. The... Uh, the melons, as I said, look great, and what's going to happen is that I've got multiples of them, so I have three per insert. So one of them will be uh, to plant in the garden under the tunnels about 15 days from now. One is a backup, and then the last one, the third one, will be grafted onto squash rootstock. And I actually have the squash rootstock coming up over there. It's just now coming up. And I think actually we might do it. We might be at the right timing. I did this as a trial run to start and it didn't work out because I started this, the rootstock and the melons on the same day. So I learned that I have to start the, the melons a week before the rootstock. If the timing lines up right and the width of all of these plants is right, I will do my grafting hopefully rather successfully. And we will heal them over for about seven days in that chamber over there. Keep the humidity high, as high as possible. And then hopefully we get ourselves some grafted melons and grafted cucumbers. The problem, I guess, would be is if we fail, well, then I have a backup, right? Because I have one that's going to be going in the garden, and then I have an extra, even an extra melon plant as a backup. So we're doing well. Um, they've all come up, I think, except for one variety there. Delicious 51, I believe, is the variety. So I'll have to plant more seeds of that. Not sure, but these melons are doing good. I'm really happy with their progress, along with these figs. The tomatoes look pretty good. Some of these tomatoes still have yet to come up, but you know, some of them take time. So that's the beauty of having different genetics. They're all gonna germinate at different rates. And uh, yeah, it's pretty cool. So that was the greenhouse update here, guys. I hope everybody enjoyed this one. There is, like I said, so much going on in here. Um, hopefully we will uh, keep you guys updated on this and the figs will be popping anytime soon. And uh, we'll show you guys the updates on that. And as I talked about the thinning and also the, uh, the staking and whatnot. And hopefully I'll get to show you guys more fruits rather than just these male fruits that will never actually ripen and be edible. So, all right guys, this was Ross, take care.